Welcome everybody to the Library of Congress. I'm John Haskell, the director of the Kluge Center, uh, and we're a sponsor of this event. In case you don't know, many of you don't know anything about the Kluge Center, just a sentence of, uh, uh, on it. I set out to, in its charter, the purpose of the Kluge Center is to bridge the gap between scholarship on the one hand, Congress, policy, other policymakers, and the interested public on the other. And the aim is to contribute to the conversation about the challenges facing democracies in the 21st century. Tonight's event, as, as suggested by its title, is meant to enlighten us about the political and cultural significance of Star Wars. I must emphasize, though, that I'm in no position to comment as to whether it will achieve that end, not only because the panel isn't, hasn't really actually happened yet, <laughs> but also because I've never seen any of the Star Wars movies. <laughs> with, with that, they're making a documentary on me, actually. <laughs> with that, let's turn to the panelists. First, I want to introduce our moderator, Colleen Shogan. Uh, Colleen will begin a new position at the library as the Assistant Deputy Librarian for Collections and Services. On Monday, she's, she's searching for an acronym. Let her know if you have one for her. She's a political scientist. She specializes in American institutions, and she writes both fiction and nonfiction. Her readers can decide whether the distinction is clear. <laughs> Colleen has been a Star Wars fan since the age of seven. A long time ago, though, in a galaxy far, far away, she taught a course on Star Wars at Phillips Andover Academy. Right. Recently, she's blogged on the politics of Han Solo, her favorite Star Wars character, however, is Darth Vader. I have to take it on faith that she sh shares traits with that gentleman. <laughs> so, Bill Davies is right here, uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Justice, Law, and Criminology at American University. He teaches a number of classes on legal history and jurisp jurisprudence, where he gets to draw analogies between the fall of the Roman and Galactic Republics, Plato's Guardians, and Yoda's Jedi. Am, am I pronouncing that right? <laughs> And how the colonial rebel, rebels successfully, the colonial rebels, sorry about that, successfully beat down the British Empire. <laughs> he grew up in England just a stone's throw away from Pinewood Studios where the Star Wars movies were and continued in large part filmed. Henry Jenkins, over here. Uh, Henry is currently Kluge Chair of Modern Culture here at the library. Uh, and he's the Provost's Professor of Communication Journalism, Cinematic Art and Education at the University of Southern California. He was the co-founder and co-director of the MIT Com Comparative Media Studies Program. His podcast, How Do You Like It So Far, examines the intersection between pop culture and a changing society, and he recently did a series focused on The Last Jedi. As a college journalist, he once turned down a pre-release interview with Carrie Fisher Harrison Ford, and Mark Hamill because he thought Star Wars was a really dumb name for a movie. <laughs> That's why we have the light shining on him right now. <laughs> Seth Maskett, and, and uh, another person in, dressed in black here, is a professor of political science and director of the Center on, on American Politics at the University of Denver. Uh, Seth, during the summer of 18, was a Kluge Chair in American Law and Governance an internationally recognized scholar on the party system. He has also written and lectured extensively on the politics of Star Wars, including even the politics of the 1978 holiday special. <laughs> Seth was not born at that time, however. He's been a fan of the series since he was eight. Sadly, the most exciting moment of his adult life was when Mark Hamill retweeted him. <laughs> Suara Salah, right here, is a data, data analyst at the center uh, for Government Excellence at Johns Hopkins, which works to help city governments improve their data and performance management practices. He's also a co-host of Beltway Banthas, the Star Wars and Politics podcast, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, mm -hmm. podcast, with his, with his conservative counterpart, a gentleman named Stephen Kent. They discuss and analyze all intersections of the film series and U.S. politics. Having esteemed guests like John Lovett and Seth Maskett, yeah, Seth Maskett. Suara is also one of the creators and organizers of hashtag SW Rep Matters, an online celebration and advocacy campaign for diversity and inclusion in a galaxy far, far away. Take it away, Colleen. All right, cool, great. Uh, I've been like waiting for this 
all week, probably like all month, so um, uh, thanks for coming. Just a few announcements. We do have the film outside today, just I know you all know, but at 7.30 uh, we will go outside and we're going to play Empire tonight on the North Lawn, and then tomorrow night at 7.30 we're uh, going to play Return of the Jedi. They're going to be great nights both nights. Ask you to come back and enjoy uh, the Library of Congress, Star Wars Under the Stars. And tomorrow also our display of Star Wars uh, items from our collection are going to be in the Jefferson building from 1 p.m. to 6. So if you come a little bit early for the movie, uh, come and check out uh, this terrific uh, display of materials that we have from the Library of Congress collection here in the Jefferson building that will be on display from 1 p.m. to 6 tomorrow. So let's get started. Uh, so the, what we're going to do is start out with a quick round robin, just for fun, uh, and then we'll get into some political questions. So first, easy question. Question. Favorite Star Wars film? Suara? Uh, is this on? Uh, the Last Jedi. Of all the questions you sent us, this was the one I stressed about the most. <laughs> <I have. laughs> so I'll just say, I've been saying Empire Strikes Back for years, yeah. and now I'm leaning Rogue One. Ooh. Ooh. A convert. Okay. Uh, uh, for me, it was Empire Strikes Back. That hooked me. Uh, otherwise, it's got to be Revenge of the Sith. Ooh. I like it, a prequel, okay. So I started, I wanted to sort of say The People versus George Lucas is a Star Wars film, <laughs> but, because um, I'm in that one, but, uh, but I ended up with Empire, but I'm, Force Awakens is really gaining on it as I watch them all back through again, getting ready for this. Okay, uh, another quick question. Favorite Star Wars character? Ray. Lando. Mm. This is the one I stressed about. Uh, <laughs> Okay, spare the moment, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, Chewbacca, us furballs have to stick together. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, and a couple more quick up or down and maybe just a sentence for why. Uh, up or down, solo, a Star Wars story. Down. Mm. Extremely down. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> up. Oh. Yeah, I'm definitely up. I think the critics... M I didn't understand the role of backstory at all when they responded to that film. Okay, great. Uh, and even more controversial, um, The Last Jedi. Stratospherically up. <laughs> uh, I definitely liked it. Some parts more than others, but uh, de definitely a positive. It was a catastrophic down at the beginning. Ooh. <laughs> then, See, it, this is... then it became an up, and now it's, <laughs> it's teetering again. Okay. No, I'm, de I, I'm definitely up. It's flawed like, and a bit incoherent like the rest of the Star Wars films, but <laughs> I think it's much, much better than its critics concede. Okay. So now we'll pivot to the theme of our panel today, which is politics and Star Wars. Um, first question, very general. Are these really Star Wars films? Are these really political films, number one? And number two, uh, in recent years, how much has... Star Wars served as a proxy for what's going on in American politics uh, t t today, recently. Yeah, uh, politics has been embedded in Star Wars from the start. In mm -hmm. episode four, New Hope, you have this small imperial council talking about what's going on with the Galactic Senate, about the Emperor dissolving it. They're talking about the politics and the optics of their operations. Uh, they talk about the Old Republic. It's all baked in there. George Lucas actually intended the original trilogy to be a sort of allegory for how the US, us, was conducting itself abroad, specifically in Vietnam. When you look at, in Return of the Jedi, at the Ewoks, of all things, he actually intended that to be a sort of allegory for the Viet Cong and Vietnam rebels, uh, where we were you know, doing a lot of interference. And yeah, he especially in the uh, prequel trilogy, Double Down on this, making clear, obvious parallels to what's going on in Afghanistan, Iraq, the Middle East generally. What is interesting about that, he started writing the story for that before 9-11, before the events of the war on terror that unfolded later. So he was actually writing co-currently with that. This is a sort of running theme for George Lucas. The threat of a larger power overtaking smaller powers or smaller uh, countries or entities. And uh, yeah, it's been embedded from the beginning. I think we just haven't thought of it as much in the original trilogy 
uh, until now with the prequels and the sequel trilogy because it was so much more subtle in the original trilogy. Now it's a lot more obvious. You want to take that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. The, you know, in the original trilogy, it, it's a political setting, but it is, it's a vague enough political message that you can read almost anything you want into it. It's basically a, it's a, it's a liberation story. It's not really making too many enemies in that. Um, it's when we get into the prequels, which I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to diss, it just, just name it, but um, <laughs> those are, and that's where Lucas is given pretty much free reign to, to write what he wants, and those are just very overtly political films. You actually have scenes in several of the films that take place in legislatures. You see voting in the, in the, in the, in the galactic legislature. How many films, how many action films, sci-fi films, do you see voting in a legislative body? <laughs> It is very rare. Several of the main characters are senators. Uh, the, the, the chancellor is a main character. You have a lot of people, you know, Jedi leaders who play also some political role. Those are very, those are overtly political films. Um, I think Revenge of the Sith was, was very clearly in, in, in a number of ways designed as a, as a pushback against George W. Bush. Obviously, the, the earlier films were, had other messages built into them. But um, yeah, I'd say he wants us to be paying attention to politics. He thinks what's going on there is important. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that categorization. I, I think the original trilogies are less about politics and more about, you know, classic science fiction themes like the human condition and uh, you know, the power of love and forgiveness and sacrifice and everything that science fiction is really designed to do is enable us to explore what it means to be human. The, 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 the prequel trilogies are, uh, as has been said, overtly political. Um, and I enjoy them for that reason, actually. Um, the, the, the one thing that is missing from the prequel politics is the judiciary. We don't get any mention of the courts. Um, and so... We got um, one mention in episode yeah. one. Yeah, and you, you get a clone Why Wars... Why would that be relevant? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe maybe they'll, they'll cover this gap in the next episode, but uh, yeah, th that's, that's what misses, uh, is missing for me as a, as a legal scholar, at least. As a media scholar, I come at it from a slightly different angle because while I'm interested in the politics in the film, I'm also very interested in the politics around, around the film. So my, in my recent book, By Any Media Necessary, we interviewed about 200 young activists and heard consistently that the language of American politics was broken, both because it was exclusive, it was inside the beltway, it was hard to understand for first-time voters, and it was repulsive insofar as the partisanship clouded any discussion of the issues. What we found, though, was pop culture provides that generation with the language they use to talk about social change, whether it's Three Finger Salute from Hunger Games or Princess Leia at the Women's March. We're seeing a variety of signs from that. This is what we call the civic imagination. So the civic imagination is how do we imagine a better world? How do we think of ourselves as a civic agent? And that's baked into this mythological structure of Star Wars to such a degree that it has been a particularly evocative text. Whether we're gonna talk about Ronald Reagan's, whether he did or didn't mean evil empire as an allusion to Star Wars, or whether the Star Wars critique of Kennedy that he later embraced of his strategic missiles or we could talk about uh, the use of, of the Hoff sequence by protesters in Madison, Wisconsin, who used the icy landscape to, pick up, to go after Scott Walker and call him, let's go after, let's fight the Imperial Walkers. People even dressed up like <laughs> at, at, at uh, the, the, that particular protest. So we're seeing Star Wars iconography crop up all over the place in contemporary American politics. And it is the way we think today. I, it's not a new thing that we use imagination for politics. Uh, I like to point to the, what I call the cosplay George Washington in the Smithsonian. There's a statue of George Washington wearing a toga. I'm, unless he went to toga parties at William and Mary, I don't think he actually wore a toga, but it tells us that there was a fantasy of restoring classical democracy that shaped the founding fathers who wrote in pen names, suits we call them today, of Roman orators and Greek heroes to, to fight for democracy. So students today who are using Star Wars characters to think about social change are part of a continuum where the imagination always plays an active role in how we think about political change. Yeah, what is Star Wars but our modern mythology? Absolutely. And if that's the case, we're gonna draw on it for political discourse. Absolutely. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the prequels. I actually rewatched the prequels, and I, and I kind of like them if you're looking at them from a political science perspective. Um, but one thing that bothers me is what we just touched on a little bit here is, this, is the separation of powers. So maybe, Seth, you can talk to us a little bit about the legislator, legislature, the Galactic Senate, its strengths and weaknesses, and then we can collectively talk about what is the role, I'm more and more confused by the role of the Jedi. Is that supposed to be the executive power? Who are they accountable for? And do we have to face up to the fact that the Jedi are partially responsible for the fall of the Republic? Okay, so... <laughs> um, Easy hitter. When I, uh, when I teach, actually, legislatures, yeah. I usually start off with the scene in, of the legislature in the Galactic Republic uh, from, uh, from Phantom Menace. And just, you know, I got like two minutes of legislative behavior here, and I ask students to say, well, oh, um, tell me what's missing. Assuming this is an actual legislature, what, what should be here that isn't? Um, one of the things that's there, or that should be there, uh, is parties. Um, this is apparently an enormous legislature. We're never, we don't know the exact size, but there are thousands, maybe tens of thousands of systems represented. And they don't seem very well organized. Um, one of the things that would very likely emerge here is some sort of party divisions, and, and we don't see that. We don't see any sort of formal order for the way things are done. Uh, there's uh, uh, Queen Amidala gets to address the legislature as a non-member of that legislature. If that happened, this thing wouldn't last a thousand generations. It wouldn't last a thousand minutes. I mean, this is, this is it, it's, it's kind of a mess. And also, there's no media, as far as we can tell. I mean, there's some little floating droid. I don't know what that thing is, but, um, you know, they're talking about a... Uh, you know, you have some members saying, hey, the, the Trade Federation is invading my planet, and other members saying, no, no, they're not. And there's no finality of that at all. So, well, maybe we should have a report. Or maybe they're, you know, turn on CNN or something, um, and you might have some sort of inkling of what's going on. There, there's no evidence that any of that occurs in there. Um, so there's, there's a number of important problems uh, w with the way this legislature is prevented. Also, they just, you know, an outside member, when she gets to speak, calls for a vote of no confidence in the leader of the chamber. This is ridiculous. Um, and then in, this, in the second prequel, when they vote, uh, they, there's no eyes or nose. There's just grunts. They just go like this and grunt. <laughs> and that's presumably a vote, either for some piece of legislation. Um, so... Yeah, problems. Uh, briefly... Maybe a lack of formal rules. That, that's yeah. Immature institution. Y yeah. 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 Although yeah. it's a thousand generations old, yeah. that's a problem. Yeah. Okay. yeah, when George Lucas was writing these films, he wasn't thinking of these specific rules. He was thinking, what can I put in for dramatic tension? Because Padme Amidala is one of the main protagonists, I'm going to have her be pressured into calling for a vote of no confidence. But as you point out, Seth, this makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> the system would fall apart in a day if like any a monarch or a ruler from any planet could just barge in and like demand whatever they wanted. Yeah, George, bless him, he, he cares a lot about politics. He doesn't know how to write politics very well. And I actually want to suggest a uh, article on NPR by Tamara Keith and Scott Detrow. Uh, the politics of Star Wars make no sense. It is a very informative and very entertaining read. Well, all that said, he does understand the symbolism of the legislative branch. I mean, for me, the great moment in Revenge of the Sith is when Yoda and, and, and Darth Sidious are fighting in the legislative chamber. And, and what is Darth Sidious using as his weapon? He's using the, 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 pods, <laughs> yeah, the pods that they use to deliberate. And, and uh, for me, that's a great symbolic moment that this is just a weapon for Darth Sidious to, to gain power. So I thought I'd throw in a couple of examples of how that translates back to real world Senate politics. So Ted Cruz, as some of you may know, is a hardcore Star Wars fan, releases a pre an ad for his presidential campaign where he turns the US Constitution into a lightsaber, <laughs> goes after Obama, who's ripping up the Constitution with a pack of wild donkeys, riding an elephant, charging into battle, fights his way through a pack of rhinos, and finally rescues the capital from uh, the control of... So it's a politics, everybody's incoherent as uh, what we're describing in Star Wars itself. That turned around, though, when in one of his campaign appearances in New Hampshire, a young activist, Andrew Slack, showed up, gave him a lightsaber, which he loved, and started waving around in front of the cameras, and then Andrew proceeded to ask what kind of senator he was. Was he Organa or Palpatine? 
uh, and using the notion of the dark force or dark money as a metaphor to think about campaign finance reform. And the conversation shut down fairly quickly <laughs> uh, as the Star Wars fan running for president realized that he was probably on the wrong side of that metaphor. <laughs> uh, one more Ted Cruz story. He actually made, he made, uh, I think during the yeah, 2016 election, a, an ad where he set himself and Hillary and Barack Obama to the trailer of The Force Awakens. He was setting himself as Rey, he was setting Barack Obama as Darth Vader, and Hillary as Kylo Ren. Uh, no offense, Senator Cruz, uh, you are no Rey. <laughs> and nobody wants to touch my question about the Jedi. And, uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, okay, yeah no okay. definitely. This is like, right. th th this, is a, this is an extremely important point because the Jedi, as they started out, they're a spiritual religious organization. They say, oh, we're here to help promote peace, but in our own spiritual way, letting the will of the Force guide us. The Force doesn't play politics, unfortunately. It is outside any sort of institution. So, you know, my, our theory on our show for what happened with the Jedi throughout the generations of the Republic is, as the Republic became more and more consolidated, and needed some sort of peacekeeping force across these disparate systems, the Jedi sort of stepped in uh, increasingly. They were increasingly embroiled in, for lack of a better term, earthly affairs, and they essentially became a political institution onto themselves. That, and they weren't even enshrined in the Constitution. So when you have in Revenge of the Sith, uh, Mace Windu and the other Jedi trying to arrest Palpatine, what grounds do they have to do that? It certainly not in the Constitution. Like Palpatine, probably notes like is thinking to himself, "What are they doing?" Like even if he weren't a Sith, no, this is something else the Jedi are doing. They are discriminating against uh, the Chancellor for his religious affiliation. <laughs> so you know, there's another question in there. Uh, again, George wasn't really thinking that much about the rules, but he gave a lot of really great fodder for us to dig into. <laughs> I, I wrote a piece of, a few years ago about the role of the Jedi. So as I, as I see them, they are, they are a secretive, powerful religious order. They recruit children at a very young age and indoctrinate them. They have this quasi-governing role that are totally unaccountable. They're, they're basically the Taliban. Um, so, uh, yeah, anyway, not a fan. Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, for me, the Jedi are, um, looking at this from a jurisprudence angle, I think the Jedi are the... This, this, weird manifestation of, of concepts of natural law. Like there's this underlying structure to the universe that um, is morally sound, and we just need to work out what these morally, moral precepts are and live our lives to them. And the Jedi are this manifestation in the real world of natural law. And Star Wars is, is in a way, it's a, it's a critique of natural law in the sense that as soon as these uh, manifestations of natural law have to interact in the real world, um, then they fail. They become too rigid, they become too absolute, and it just can't deal with the dirty reality of everyday politics. So, so Wolf, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'm again playing my role of bringing this back to the yeah. realm of real world politics. One of the interesting Jedi mobilizations was by a group called the Rebel Alliance, which was concerned with public education. And they discovered that May the 4th, the official Star Wars holiday, was uh, existed the same week as uh, Teacher Appreciation Week. So they <laughs> launched a campaign called uh, Teach Us You Did, where people yeah, pay tribute yeah. to their mentors. Now, I was bemused by this because mentorship is maybe not the most successful <laughs> yeah. side of the Jedi's uh, role in society. <laughs> I mean, if I failed my students as bad as most of those teachers did, I would be probably out of my job even with tenure. Uh, right, right, right. There's all kinds of inappropriate relationships modeled in the Star Wars films in terms of the Jedi. Right. Um, we'll move on to the original trilogy. So the theme, one of the big political themes of the original trilogy is, is rebellion, the theme of rebellion. And one thing that I've always struggled with is how this 
much, much smaller, much less resourced rebel force is able to actually uh, land punches and make gains and ultimately overthrow the empire, this huge monolithic empire. And the empire is clearly a bureaucratic organization, it's hierarchical. So what does that tell us, that there is this small force that's able to overthrow the empire? What does that tell us about the empire as a regime and maybe talk a little bit about the theme of rebellion and how that's been used by politicians and political protests, you know, in the political context. I may jump in on this. Um, so I actually want to recommend on this uh, uh, a piece at, at Vox, Mistress of Faction, written by Amy Erica Smith, who wrote uh, actually some commentary on, on the Solo movie. Um, this is the one, the, the one piece of praise I'll, I'll offer for this film, is that it shows us uh, the, the bureaucratic weakness of the empire. Um, this is, it's a government that's actually not been around very long by the time we, we, we see these events unfold, and they're having trouble staffing up. Uh, it's actually hard to uh, develop a bureaucracy. There's um, not a lot of job security. There, there's, not, there's not a lot of there's, job There's big punishment yeah. if you screw up. If you, yeah. yeah, if you rise too high, Vader will choke you. And, 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 and so it's actually fairly hard to coordinate things across great distances. One of the things that, that is kind of, well, actually very inconsistent across all these films is just how large this universe is and how easy it is to, to communicate and to travel across it. In the early films, it seems to actually take a very long time. Um, it's harder to administer the Outer Rim planets, which is why slavery basically existed there unchecked for so long, which is why local uh, warlords and, and mob bosses basically have, right. have free reign there. So in many ways, it's actually a very vulnerable system. Um, and, uh, you know, the rebels were, were pretty good at, uh, you know, finding its, its weak places. Um, plus, you had the fact that the, uh, you know, one of, I, th I think, very foolish things that, um, that the emperor did was dissolve the imperial senate. Right. Yeah. Which was obviously not a, you know, not a very strong or important body, but it held, it held a vital symbolic role. It told people that if you have problems, there is a political organization where you can channel them. And once that was gone, yeah. there, there was really, there was no political solution to anything. Yeah, and they were expecting the Death Star, along with the regional governors, to keep the local systems in line. Like, that was the exact line in episode four. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, yeah, Seth, you hit the nail on the head. It's really about the sheer magnitude of trying to govern an entire galaxy with hundreds of thousands of systems, basically. The thing about the Republic is... Yeah, this is just like, I know we're trying to be general here, but this is something I've read around that. It was initially started as a sort of trade uh, system, like for plants to facilitate like trade and econo economic uh, stuff, sorry, <laughs> uh, across uh, the galaxy. So when you get to the empire that's trying to uh, express like a lot of control over the galaxy, then you run into problems. And then you don't have the Senate that, like Seth said, was this sort of conduit between the citizenry and the executive. Um, so the Rebel Alliance, f coming from various systems like uh, General Akbar and his compatriots from Mon Calamari, um, uh, Alderaan, c other systems I'm not gonna go into, but various across the galaxy, joined together and found the weak spots in this very poorly managed system, and they were effectively able to dismantle the structure from the inside with the final victory being at Endor, um, or Battle of Jakku, if like you know, have to know Battlefront too. Uh, so, so yeah, it's like, just be, like larger does not always equal better. There, in a lot of ways it felt like the Roman Empire with its structural uh, like weaknesses and other empires when you like look through world history and it was only a matter of time, really. Um, I, I would add that um, I think Lucas had the uh, experiences of the 1930s, you know, the dictatorships in Europe in mind when he was thinking not just about the appearance of the stormtroopers and imperial officers, but the way that this bloated bureaucracy was functioning and the main job for these bureaucrats was not to actually do their job really well, it was to please the superior um, and make sure that the superior doesn't strangle them to death. Yeah, that was Palpatine's ruling style. Exactly. Um, what I really like about the new uh, novels, the Aftermath series and the Thrawn uh, novels, is that they, it really gets into the details of that. You really see some of these horrible, horrible bureaucrats who always tend to be uh, depicted as a kind of Hermann Goering, very overweight and selfish and horrible 
bureaucrat who does whatever he can do to make sure that he stays in his position regardless of any kind of merits of any of his uh, inferiors. And the one thing that really stands out for me about Thrawn in, in these books is that he, he runs his ship as a meritocracy. And, and that's why it's so much more efficient and so much more effective, his ship, compared to the other Imperial, uh, uh, the other ships in the, staff, in the Imperial um, uh, fleet. Um, so I, I really think that that was a, a part of Lucas's vision too. Is Maria, but what about the theme of rebellion politically? Well, I, th I think we've, we've, there's no accident that we're using the term the resistance right now to talk about progressive pushback against Donald Trump, right? And thanks, thanks to Princess Leia standing over my head here, right? Uh -huh. She has given us a model for thinking about an organization that's intersectional, that involves people from a variety of different backgrounds. Um, we could say something about her racism toward Wookiees in particular, <laughs> which is problematic. Yeah, she had and just lost her planet. Like Give her a break. She talk up for people of locker fur. Locker room talk. That was. Uh, people <laughs> of fur need to be. Uh, sort of need better treatment within the re resistance. But I think, nevertheless, uh, that, and it doesn't just locker room talk because it results in him not getting a medal and having to That's stand true. behind everyone That's else. That's true. Right? Uh, That's justice true. for Wookiees, hashtag. Uh, but, you know, but the interesting thing is you can move in, you can be a fly, or you can be a farm boy one day and a commander in the resistance movement the next, right? That right. there's... A, a yeah, certain meritocracy right. in her sense of command that results in both Han and Luke and later later Ray and Finn being immediately incorporated right. into that. There's a willingness to listen to subordinates talk back. I think that's that's an interesting model of what a political organization might do, but also a willingness to put men in their place, which I think is also yeah. a really interesting model in our Me Too Times Up moment to see what, it, what, what command looks like over a resistance movement. So this is a good segue into our next discussion, which is about race and gender and diversity in the Star Wars universe. So the first question, it, you know, we see elements of democracy in the Star Wars universe. We see elements of republicanism, representativeness in the Star Wars universe. Do we see elements, is, is the Star Wars universe ever a liberal society, a rights-based society, or is that just non-existent? in the Star Wars universe? So, until the Disney era, for the most part, Star Wars, a franchise I've loved with all my heart since I was nine, has been mainly headlined by white men. It's, uh, you know, and the fandom has always been very diverse, but at the same time, certain voices would only, would be uh, highlighted. And, a lot of people of color and women, even like a lot of women, would be out of the conversation about this. I'm talking about both the Star Wars universe and the fandom here. Uh, the Disney era has made a lot of great strides when you look from The Force Awakens to uh, Last Jedi, Solo, uh, Rogue One, especially with a super diverse cast. Uh, but there's still strides to go on with that. And it's interesting because George Lucas did intend the Rebel Alliance to be a multi-racial or multi-species coalition against the, quote, human supremacist empire. Like, the allegory was meant to be that the empire was like a Nazi organization only promoting human rights and not aliens' rights, and that was a metaphor George Lucas was going for. It wasn't race-based, but it was species-based, and again, that was the metaphor. Um, I'm not sure, like, with the new canon, like, how much that's really being digged into now, but I do know that was, like, very much in his thinking. Uh, and, but it is still interesting, because when you look at the original trilogy films, it would only, it was mostly human. It wasn't until, uh, besides Chewbacca, it wasn't until episode six when we saw aliens in the Rebel Alliance. Uh, and we didn't even really get that much talk about the human supremacy of the empire. It was something that you'd read in books or George would talk about maybe in some interviews here and there. So all of this is a very, it's, it's very interesting to think about. It can be uncomfortable at times, but it does necessitate a discussion. Uh, again, Star Wars, uh, when you look at the films now, they're making strides. It can certainly go further. And I think for on the uh, woman question, I think barely any of the films pass the Bechdel test. Uh, so, and if they do, it's only for like 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, 
there's a long way to go um, in terms of uh, pr it promoting a, uh, you know, I think this is like tangential to being li to being more liberal, like a more diverse society when we're looking at the discussion in our politics today. Uh, so it has it's a, a question ways to of go. major characters that are people of color, right? I mean, right, there are yeah. people of color who are characters, even in the recent Star Wars movies. But what are they doing? How you know? What is their storylines? Things like that, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like I love the Last Jedi. It's my favorite Star Wars film, but I appreciate and uh, agree with a lot of the criticisms of how it treats its uh, people of color and uh, its women. Um, you know, like I think that it does try to dig into some really serious conversations. And I love Ryan Johnson. I think he's a brilliant director, brilliant writer. I think it would have helped a lot if he happened to have a woman of color uh, co-writer or co-director to look at some, when you look at a lot of the uh, conversation in the media about the film, this film and some of the racial and uh, sex-based uh, issues it has, I think, this would have solved a lot of it. If he, ha if it, w like Lucasfilm, I, it has a bit of a white man problem where it is mostly white men creators creating and writing these films. And I think it can be opened up more, especially, you know, for example, just have more women, have more people of color, have people of the LGBT community. It's, uh, we're living in an era now where people know so much more about how their films are made and, you know, it's like clear on the screen when we're watching them as well. Um, so I want to recommend another uh, uh, blog post. This is, I believe, by Sarah Parkinson at The Monkey Cage. Uh, she did a little write-up of Rogue One, noting that, you know, one of, one of the real innovations of that film is that it showed the centrality of, of women to the resistance movement. Not necessarily as, as the lead fighters, but the organizers of it, the generals, the people who are connected right. from different systems and actually put this thing together. That includes people like Jin Erso, that includes Mon Mothma, that includes Leia. Um, and she notes that this is actually a familiar pattern in a lot of resistance movements around the world that we see today. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't know that I would necessarily call that. I mean, that, that was a very good film for representation. I don't know if I would call it a feminist film by, by a long shot, but it was... Um, uh, like like, like Jin's story, and this is a criticism I've heard from a lot of my woman friends, is that a lot of her plot is based on the actions of men, or like her father in particular. I mean, I think I think she had a great plot overall. I think it was very compelling, and I think she can be a really great role model, but I do understand those criticisms as well. We should have women writers for these films. No, no, no absolutely. Um, I mean, the interesting thing about the politics of these films is there's one contingent who thinks it hasn't gone far enough or far enough fast enough. And we can look at fandom as a site which really has, for a long time, fought for representational politics. Even something like cosplay, which yeah. traditionally was about fidelity to the original costume, is now being used as a tool to help us imagine what a more racially and diverse or more gender, uh, binary, non-binary, Star Wars might look like, and so it's a tool. Fan fiction has been a tool for imagining other possibilities. Although the interesting data there was coming out of uh, Force Awakens, where you have these characters of color, the most popular pairing in fan fiction has been Hux and R Rilo, uh, Kylo Ren. Oh. <laughs> uh, not the, any of the yeah, characters of color. So that, that even fan fiction has failed us yeah. in terms of imagining what diversity would look like. On the other <laughs> side, we have the people who are ang the angry fanboy, the so-called toxic right. fan masculinities, which from the very beginning was hostile to the new films. With some good reason, right? It's a very mixed group that we're talking about. Uh, there's a lot of built-up animosity, you know, going back you know, on a variety of issues. But a lot of them do have to do with gender and racial representational yep. issues. The media overblew some parts of the story. It turns out the hashtag Black Stormtrooper was built around a Lego movie that had nothing to do with race. The very small percentage, when you crunch the numbers, were racially you know, white supremacist posts. But there is that discourse there that people are looking at and that we need to think about. So there's a struggle around the politics of the film that's very real. The problem when the media overrepresents toxic fandom and backlash is it allows the producer to say, we need to go slow because our base is upset. Yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, it, it doesn't recognize, and the media is not covering all of the progressive moves toward representational politics and fandom. Right. It's like when we're looking at The Last Jedi reaction, for example, when you look at uh, different metrics, you have something called Cinema Score, which pulls audiences directly when they're coming out of the movie. The Last Jedi got an A grade on Rotten Tomatoes, which allows anyone to go on and comment and put whatever rating they want. It has something like a 45% Rotten. That is a coordinated campaign to try to dash the score of a film. You're absolutely right. It's like, it's so overblown, it's so frustrating because the broad majority of the public, and when I talk to people outside of hardcore fandom, like a lot, most liked or loved the film. However, I have friends that didn't like the film as well, and that's fine. What they do is they say, I don't like this, I'm moving along with my fandom. For example, I didn't like Solo, I'm just gonna leave it at that. I don't need to harp on anyone else for loving it. <laughs> and I do have friends that love it. <laughs> so, so I think it matters though that Finn is a, is a black yes. stormtrooper, right? I mean, I think Franz Fanon could write a whole book just about Finn's journey <laughs> from someone whose peoples have been conquered. He's enlisted into the service. He struggles with his con issues of conscience and finally rebels, but is torn between a desire to get out of the system and a desire to become a hero in the system's terms. And I think there's a really powerful journey just around the edges in terms of thinking about what, why it matters Finn takes place. Rewatching the films getting ready for this though, the moment that really threw me out of my chair is at the beginning of Sith, there's a rolling credit that tells us there were good people on both sides of the Clone Wars. <laughs> and I kid you not, right? And unless this is another one of George Lucas's alteration of the text, oh, George. I'm assuming it was there all along. Uh, yeah. So um, our last question, before we, I wanna get to the audience, because I know you guys have a lot of questions. So we'll, we'll fast forward here to the sequel trilogy. Right now we know they're filming episode nine. There's not that much information out there, but they're filming episode nine. And the one thing we do know about episode nine is that it is going to be the last episode that's gonna deal with the Skywalker saga. That has been made very clear. So I have a two-part question for the panel. This is the last question, then we'll go to the audience. Uh, how do you want the Skywalker saga to end, and how do you think the Skywalker saga will end? So those are, could be two different questions. How do you want it to end, and how do you think it is going to end in episode nine? Uh, so, toughie. yeah, I have been so in the middle of this debate, raging <laughs> online. Uh, <laughs> d d well, this is your, you're yeah. at the Library of Congress, okay, yeah. you're so, on record. Yeah. So, so, this is part yes, of, yes, this exactly, is part of exactly. national, okay. Exactly. okay, no pressure. The, I view the Skywalkers <laughs> as Icarus, flying too close to the sun, to talk about another mythic reference. I love Luke and Leia, they're two of my favorite characters of all time, but I think even they would agree, by the end of The Last Jedi, that their time has passed, that what they need to focus on is what's good for the galaxy at large. The Skywalkers are the family we've been following for so long, but there are things far more important than one single family. Kylo Ren, who is a fascinating, conflicted character in both The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi, has had multiple times at going to the other side or helping the resistance or trying to atone for the various sins he has committed. There is maybe a chance at redemption for him in episode nine, but I think I'm very much 50-50 on it of whether it's gonna happen. We will see. I think my ideal for episode nine for the Skywalker saga to be wrapped up is for Rey to lead a new order of Jedi, for her to undergo a journey of understanding what it is that she really wants to do in this galaxy and how she wants to contribute and to let go of trying to live up to another's legacy. And for, Ky for Kylo Ren, I don't know what I want for him exactly. I think whatever happens in the film, I will like and appreciate if they do it well. I could see him dying, I could see him being redeemed and then dying, I could see him going into exile. As long as they do it well, I'm for it. What I think will happen if I'm trying to gauge uh, uh, like chances here and there, I think they will pull a Vader with Kylo Ren. 
I think that he will be redeemed. He'll do some action to help the resistance, but then he will die, uh, following the legacy of his grandfather and potentially being welcomed into the Force Ghost afterlife by Luke, Yoda, Obi Wan, and Anakin. Uh, when, what music is playing when that? Uh, prob- probably the Force theme. It would definitely yeah. be the Force theme. Um, but honestly, as long as Ray, Finn, Poe, Rose, and the, our Resistance heroes, as long as they get to have their you know, shining moments in episode nine and the story is really focused on them and how they're going to save the galaxy, I'm happy. Sure, thanks. Uh, so uh, one of the exciting things I, I, I really enjoyed about Solo uh, was this discussion or this nascent discussion about droid rights. Um, and I, I think that really has a good potential for uh, a more neutral or a more dispassioned discussion about equality and rights that we, we, we talked about in the, in, the, in the previous discussion. So I, I hope that continues in the next movie. Um, what do I see happening after having just finished the Thrawn novels? Uh, Ray and Kylo Ren teaming up to fight an invasion led by Thrawn from the unknown regions and uh, Kylo Ren sacrificing himself in the process to save Rey. Uh-huh. There we go. Well, I, I, I said that I thought that Last Jedi has been somewhat misunderstood, and to me, part of what Last Jedi does incredibly well is break the cycle of the hero's journey or monomyth a la Joseph Campbell that drove so much of Lucas's own conceptions of Star Wars. And I'm drawing here a little bit on a guy named Jeff Gomez who's done a series of blog posts about Culturally, we're shifting from hero's journey to a collective journey where there are multiple protagonists, multiple ways of succeeding, multiple missions, and we form coalitions or there's intersectionality between characters and characters can sometimes be opposed and sometimes friends. So the complexity of that is part of what takes place in Last Jedi and we see that pushback and the hotshot masculinity just blowing up things is not sufficient. That's put in its place over the course of the film, which is one of the many reasons why white fanboys are often upset by Last Jedi, is that it literally is saying, not not only is the era of the Jedi over, but the era of a kind of of masculine narrative that's hero-driven has to give way to a coalition-centered narrative. So I I do think we're gonna see uh, 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 the coalition of the new characters and the passing of the torch. We already get it when Leia says, who are you looking at, follow him. Uh, at the end of Jedi, that that's a moment of passing the torch that you did, that Carrie Fisher did get in while she was alive, and we can sort of see that as a monumental moment, and we built across the three films the passing of the torch by each of those, each of those characters. And on top of the droid rights thing, I would also sit, point to Rose's moment of talking about animal rights, because we have this blurring of categories running through Star Wars. Uh, between characters that are subhuman, like think Wookiees are treated and Ewoks are treated as subhuman often in the films, and those characters that are treated as animals uh, and the relations between them. And to some degree, the Porg-Chewbacca relationship sort of starts to play with that. And Rose's moment of rescuing the horse and setting it free, or the, the creature. And the father. Like, yes, and setting it free. Uh, nerd. Uh, is um, <laughs> similarly makes those questions open. So we're now asking who has rights in yep. Star Wars as we move toward a more ensemble-based narrative and less away from it being a Skywalker saga. Uh, I, I'm okay with us moving away from the Skywalkers, but I'd just say that um, what the, the most recent films have done is they've, is they've been a way to say goodbye to the original heroes. Han Solo, Luke Skywalker got, got really nice endings. Um, and Leia deserved that, yeah. and I, I don't see any way she's going to get that now. Um, and and that is that's unfortunate. She's she, she's she's deserving of a of a good send off. Um, I don't really know the the right way to sort of end that family story. Um, I had a I had a history professor in college. Um, Slotman was his name, and he was always sort of working, I don't know if he ever finished it before he passed away, but he was working on some novel about, uh, uh, that he wanted to call The Last Habsburg, and he just wanted, just uh, The Last Habsburg just abdicating, getting in a limousine and driving away, and uh, it'd be nice if, a, if, a, if yeah. The Last Skywalker could do that. <laughs> okay, great. So we're going to go to the audience. Do we have a microphone? Uh, Roswell has a microphone. Uh, if you raise your hand, take some questions. 
So I like the prequels, I always have, but I really fell in love with the prequels even deeper once I watched The Clone Wars. I thought that it kind of enriched a lot of the political, legal aspects of it. I mean, there's a court scene in season five. The Jedi, they're immune from prosecution while they're Jedi. It's almost like ecclesiastical rights, you know, in older times. Well, what was your, what was your view of the politics of, specifically, I guess, the prequels in light of The Clone Wars? Did that change for you? Did that enrich it? Like, what was your view of that? So as uh, someone who watched The Clone Wars only recently, uh, yeah, it definitely enriched it. it I, I love um, political dramas, um, until, like, for example, West Wing or Until the Scumbag Was Removed, House of Cards. And uh, yeah, I, I find it all really fascinating seeing Padme, Bail Organa, Mon Mothma and other senators discuss uh, the Republic's public health care system. How does that work? I have no idea. Uh, but still, it's like really fascinating to hear them talk about the sort of nuances of the Clone Wars. Uh, you know, we mentioned before the line, heroes on both sides. There is actually an episode of Clone Wars entitled Heroes on Both Sides, and it shows that the Separatists are not just Count Dooku and his scary-looking alien, uh, like, compatriots. It's at, or like the Commerce Guild, like the economic, the basically really bad metaphors uh, for East Asia as a dominating force that were even racially uh, tinged, unfortunately. <laughs> and, I, I, like, this episode showed... Uh, like, yeah, the Separatists as, like, just regular people, planets that are really dissatisfied with the way that the Republic has been run and why they're trying to get out and what rights they're seeking. And in this episode, Padme goes with one of our main characters, Ahsoka, who is Anakin's apprentice in The Clone Wars. Uh, you might want, if you're interested, you might, might want to check out this series. And Ahsoka gets to see hey, these aren't monsters. These aren't uh, our sworn enemies. They're real people with genuine grievances, and maybe we should hear them out, and maybe we can come to a solution to this awful war. Um, there are a lot of like uh, episodes like that throughout the Clone Wars that deepen what each of these individual plants are going through. It's not just in the legislature. It's not just in the Senate. You actually see what's happening to the people, and I... I my relationship with the prequels, I loved them as a kid, not so much growing up. I recognize them for their many, many flaws. Uh, but I really wish that Clone Wars what was the prequels. I really wish that we were seeing these various planets that Clone Wars showed us in the actual films. I think it would have helped it a lot. Can I, can I add something to that? Oh, yeah, oh sure, sure, go ahead, sir. Um, actually, my, my favorite episode of the Clone Wars series is the uh, Trial of Ahsoka Tano. Oh, um, so good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, you get in one, uh, not, not a courtroom, I think it's, a, it's the headquarters of the, of the Navy, because uh, it's, it's a military trial, court-martial. Um, you get in one room, you get Chancellor Palpatine, you get Admiral Tarkin at the time, and you get Padme Amidala, and Asako and, and Anakin Skywalker there. And uh, for me, that's a, a, a great scene of... Uh, just how different the Jedi are from normal citizens of the Republic, but also just how much power Palpatine is exercising over the entire political and judicial process by that point. You'll have to forgive, it's not very political, but uh, I just up or down on Jar Jar and up or down on Rose. On what? On what? Rose, Jar Jar oh, oh, and Rose. Oh, oh. 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 Uh, down on Jar Jar, but uh, yeah, I had an, I had an interesting, <laughs> Ahmed Best, who played George R. Binks, was a guest on our podcast, so, yeah. and we had a long discussion about this, and he, he posed a really interesting challenge, which was that if, uh, now I'm going to lose his name, Andy Serkis had played George R., and he had played um, Gollum, how would we respond to those two characters? And he was talking about Gollum slathering on rocks and talking about Master and so forth. It would be politically incredibly awkward and difficult to imagine that. The problem is I can't imagine Andy Serkis being given the lines that Jar Jar was given in that film, right? And watching it oh, again, George. he sort of sold me in the conversation, but watching the film prequels again, I just can't get yeah, there. Yeah, it is there. a deeply problematic character yes. that, that shows Lucas's roots and minstrel humor of the 40s and so forth. Yeah, the way Jar Jar was portrayed and written was not the best, to be sure. So I just wanted to, like, 
say another note about Ahmed Best. It was actually um, revealed recently that he went through an era of depression after the Phantom Menace with all the Phantom discourse around his character. And, you know, let's remember that these are actors just doing a job and it's the writers who have created these things that we may detest. So, you know, with all due respect to Ahmed Best and all the, he really did put incredible work into the character, even though I don't really like him that much, uh, Jar Jar that is. So, yeah, with all due respect to him and everything he's been through, I'm going to give Jar Jar a thumbs down. But on the other character, Rose Tico, I give her, again, a stratospheric uh, thumbs up. I yes. will, I will yeah. say, though, about Rose, and I love Rose as a character, I wish they didn't have that kiss in Last Jedi. It just, it was completely out of place, in my opinion. That's it. Um, I, yeah, I'll... I've probably said enough about Jar Jar. Um, just, uh, but I'm a, I'm a big fan of Rose... Um, I, in, in particular, her, I, I thought her contribution to Last Jedi, just saying, uh, you know, it, it's not about the bad people we kill, it's about the good people we save, that kind of turned, in many ways, the entire franchise on its head in, in a really helpful way. Um, so, you know, if she'd done nothing else, I think that, that would be, that's an important character right there. And if we want to talk about characters who, actors who've been harassed, yes. that's the latest yeah. yes. story on harassment where angry white fanboy rage has just torn her life apart. Uh, but yeah, I think the introduction of sisterhood as a motif in the story is another step toward decentering the male narrative and emphasizing other kinds of relationships. And while we only saw her sister very briefly in the opening of Last Jedi, it's a really powerful sequence. And the scene, the play with her medal uh, that goes back to the sister, I think, is particularly strong. Yeah, the sister does play a more important role in Questions? the novelization. Um, but uh, f for me, um, Rose was important in a, in a strange way for me because growing up as a, as a white British male, I, you know, I never had any problems finding heroes that looked like me on the screen. <laughs> but I'm now, I'm, I'm married to uh, a Korean American uh, with a mixed race daughter. And for the first time I had a real visceral sense of just how important it was for someone like my young daughter to see someone who looked like her on the screen and realize that she could also emulate this hero role that, that's played in the movie. Okay, we have time for one more question. Go ahead. Very simple question. Very, uh, favorite lightsaber fight? Favorite lightsaber fight? From oh, the favorite whole... lightsaber oh, oh, fight. Oh. Good question. Oh, can I? <laughs> uh, Phantom Menace. Yeah. Yeah. Not a good film, but man, is, is that a good lightsaber scene. In, in fact, I, I'll, I'll argue that lightsaber scene actually makes the case for the film better than the film does. And that <laughs> you, yeah. It's actually, it's, it's well thought through, it's beautifully choreographed. The whole story of the lightsaber fight is that, you know, you have these two Jedi who are supposed to work together, um, but they're, and, and you have Darth Maul basically trying to tear them apart. He know he can't beat them at, if they're working together, so he's constantly trying to draw one away from the other. You see, um, uh, you know, Sometimes they're, they're trying to do sort of innovative moves that, that kind of fail. I mean, I think it's, and you see the very different Jedi versus Sith styles, I, I think absolutely beautiful. And, and Jewel of the Fates, the score to, the, to this, it, yeah. it, it, it's yes. mind blowing. Mind blowing. Yeah, when I said earlier that, when it was said earlier, I didn't want to interview the cast. I'd also seen the trailer, and in fairness, the very first trailer of Star Wars didn't have John Williams' music attached to it. Yeah. So oh. imagine how different it would be to experience Star Wars without Williams' music. Yeah, George Lucas called it the uh, secret sauce of Star Wars once, yeah. Uh, mine is actually Return of the Jedi. I think it's a very emotionally charged, beautifully choreographed, beautifully shot lightsaber battle between this father and son who are battling for each other's souls effectively. And you can tell that it's not just that their lightsabers that are clashing, even if it is done very well, it's their emotions, it's their thoughts, it's like they're projecting telepathically to each other and Mark Hamill's expressions and even Vader's expressions, even though he's in a mask. It's like, that's an effect I love about Darth Vader. It's like you can always feel, you can always tell what he's thinking or feeling by looking at him and he's like, it's just the same mask. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, it, 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 I, I really love it. It's uh, been one of my favorites. Uh, it's my favorite basically my whole life and uh, it, it means a lot to me, like in everything it portrays. Uh, for, for me, it's Revenge of the Sith. It's, it's the two brothers fighting. Um, 
I, just thinking about that opening dialogue and then when they start fighting, just I, I got goose pimples right now. <laughs> All right. Well, join me in thanking everybody here on this panel today. So, once again, please join us for Empire Strikes Back outside in the North Lawn at 7.30 and then Return of the Jedi tomorrow at 7.30 and our display open from 1 to 6 in the Jefferson Building tomorrow. Thank you.